Hello everyone. Hello everyone in the second episode. I hope you are there. Say hello. I guess uh, as always say hello from where you are. It is always so nice to see that I, we are from all around the world we can say so a lot of interest in the GC at, at least I hope so. The first episode was seen 8000 times so I was pretty surprised but I was also super super happy that it was so popular. Uh, so uh, say hello simply and let's just start because we have some topics to cover today. So uh, just uh, as a let's say introduction, I'm Konrad Kokosa and I'm uh, interested in .NET internals. So uh, that's why I'm talking about it today. And uh, I'm also a co-founder of this initiative .NET Asorg. So if you like premium .NET content internals, and other advanced stuff just for example follow me on twitter or mm, follow .netos.org account on twitter okay but having all said that today is the mark face and today we will cover the non-concurrent mark face uh, which is uh, as the name states probably you can expect there is also a concurrent version that's why uh, I split it. Uh, I split it into two parts because it is too complex, probably, to have both in the same lesson. So, today' episode is about the non-concurrent version of the Mark face. Like uh, the whole agenda is uh, presented. I was presenting this agenda also last week. So, I plan to have eight eight modules about .NET GC internals. Uh, so the, yes, the last week I, we had an introduction and the roadmap was presented, the fundamentals, some let's say basic knowledge about GC and for example compare it to the reference counting and so on. And also the very first deep dive into the source code of the .NET GC. Then today we have a mark phase, we will cover topics like roots for example. Uh, then the next following uh, weeks we will be covering another parts of the .NET GC internals and how they are working in the end. We will, um, and now, I unfortunately, I don't have any bell or something, but I have two announcements. Uh, the very first announcement uh, is that um, after thinking of the whole agenda, I thought it would be nice to extend it with one more module. So in, now uh, I plan to have nine weeks uh, about all those stuff which will be about roots internals because I will cover and mention roots today because we need to have the root concept today for the mark phase but uh, I will not cover how they are implemented and roots internals are interested by itself so how for example the stack roots are interpreted by the .NET runtime and the GC what it is a GC info what is a partially or full interruptible method this is a knowledge also pretty deep that is not often covered uh, so I believe it will be pretty interesting nine module of this mini series which becomes uh, middle series maybe because we have nine and another announcement the announcement number number two is that I s also decided to extend the whole thing with the Q&A uh, module at the end uh, because I believe we will have some questions and we will I will gather some questions during all those weeks uh, so uh, there is no chance I will have a possibility to answer them all during the session uh, today or in other on the other week so I thought it would be nice to have this uh, last one Q&A module which will be just for your questions and um, for example for example uh, I was pretty surprised and happy that this uh, previous episode has ga gathered some interest for example on Hacker News. So there was a pretty long, um, pretty interesting discussions there on Hacker News because of this very first episode and a lot of comments, a lot of interesting discussions and questions. Uh, while it is not always possible to answer in deep to some questions, for example, there was super interesting question. Okay, but why can't I m just manually delete an object in .NET in C# -sharp? So, this is a question uh, which is super nice, 
which requires covering some uh, in implementation details of .NET GC and some concepts that I will introduce in the following weeks. So, and even today, so I will answer this question at the end. And I hope we will gather such questions during the whole this um, episode. So that I believe will be nice. And also maybe we'll be able to invite Mauni Stevens to that uh, module. We will see, uh, fingers crossed. So today's agenda, the mark phase, uh, we will cover, I will cover the introduction, which will be just describing the object graph concept and object graph traversal. And then uh, some implementation, specific implementations in case of .NET, like the whole traversal algorithm, the pin and mark flag, how they are implemented, where they are implemented, and so on and so on. Also mark stack, mark list, and some story about the vectorized mark list sorting, uh, which is pretty, uh, uh, let's say, nice side note that it is perfect to put today uh, during the mark phase description. Obviously, we will uh, end with inside the code, inside the .NET runtime code, GCCPP, just to give you some points from where you can start investigating on your own the thing that I will describe today and how the source code maps in directly to the concept uh, that I will cover today. <coughs> okay, so this is the agenda for today. As always, do not hesitate. Uh, sorry, I forgot about the mic. I hope you heard at least something. Uh, I hope uh, you will. Uh, I hope you will uh, have some questions. Uh, so just uh, ask any question you will have. Uh, I will try to answer them during the talk. And if I will not be able, because maybe I will not know the answer, or maybe it was the answer is too big, I will answer somewhere else, like on the follow follow up blog post, or maybe next time. So. The mic is set, uh, the camera is set, the slides are there, so I believe we can start. I hope you heard something from the introduction without the mic. And uh, uh, okay, so <clears throat> the mark face. Uh, I decided to start from the mark face because it is the very first phase when the GC kicks in. So when the runtime decides that, okay, probably now it is a good time to make a garbage collection, it is starting from this mark phase. Uh, we need simply to know which objects are live to garbage collect those which are no live. Like if we know what objects are live, then we will be able to uh, reclaim memory from those which are not live, ho however it means, whatever it means. And uh, from the perspective of the GC at that moment, first of all, I'm not covering here any decision what triggers GC, because <laughs> this is another topic. Let's assume that the GC has been triggered triggered and just a kind of spoiler, typically, very typically, it is mm, uh, triggered because of allocations and the runtime discovers that there is not enough space for a new object, so the GC will be triggered very, very uh, shortly said. Uh, so now the GC kicks in and it needs to discover what is live or not. And from the mem from the GC perspective, now we only know that there are some objects. Uh, so we know here that, okay, there is a memory and this memory contains some objects. And obviously there are some, there is an, every object takes some space. So we will have ob object A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. And this is what the GC sees at the very beginning, just a memory, like continuous memory region with the objects lying somewhere sequentially one after the another. Then that's the, the, the view that the GC has and what we know from the GC perspective. And uh, this is one of the views. And obviously this is not enough, uh, like this is only the layout of the mem of the objects in the in the memory. So now the GC needs to do something with that. And first of all, what the GC needs to know is the metadata about those top 
types that are here. So every object is an instance of some type, obviously. So uh, the type definition is well known to the GC because it is well known to the runtime. So uh, we have the type data, metadata in general. It is called metadata and the GC is aware of it and the runtime is aware of it. So uh, here I'm using this concise uh, syntax for types, which is record uh, in C-sharp 9, just to define some, some set of types that I'm using for this uh, illustratory purposes here. So imagine that you have a record and the record in C-sharp 9 is just a class in the end. So we have a class of type I and uh, that contains field of type B and D. And those are also references because it is uh, just a field that in underneath there is a field of type B pointing to instance of uh, object of type B and so on and so on. So we have here some metadata and this is well known for the GC obviously. So, okay, uh, this is obvious. And then uh, this is still not enough. Like we know that the GC is able to see, scan the whole memory. We know that it is an, has access to the metadata. And then uh, it is also, it needs also to know the current state of your program. So uh, it needs to know what it is inside the program to know uh, what is the state and what objects are let's say hmm, at the disposal of the programmer maybe to say that in in that word so uh, for example imagine that we have only one single thread and we are inside some method and inside this method there is a line that is a newing up instance of object a and newing up an instance of object d obviously with all the necessary parameters for constructors. And uh, imagine also that just after those two lines, the GC kicks in. So we are here, we are, st we are stopping our application uh, and now the GC needs to know what is live. So it will know that, okay, uh, what we know for sure is that A and D as a local variables are the places where, from where we can start accessing our data. They are just kind of uh, anchors, kind of starting points from where um, this, um, the whole thing can be uh, reachable, re reached, let's say. And this we will return to this word many times in the next slides. So f f this is a like logical view, uh, maybe not the logical view, the physical view <laughs> is that there is a memory. Uh, on the other hand, there is a metadata, there is a current state. And from that, we can just uh, imagine drawing something that is called object graph. And uh, this graph, I'm sorry, this object graph is something that we can imagine uh, logically, <coughs> obviously, because every because every uh, instance of every object it contains some re outgoing references. Uh, so uh, there is a from example from object of type A, uh, there is a reference of type B and D, so it can point to some object of type B and D. And every such a type having some outgoing references will point to some objects. So in the end, we are building such an huge graph called object graph, a references graph between every instance of our um, object being in the memory. So uh, this is pretty straightforward, I hope so. So you have, uh, you can imagine that th this is a logical view of what's inside your application, showing all the references between objects and an uh, important part of it are those roots. So the place from which we can start to look at this object graph from the programmer or the code perspective. So here, for example, will be our A local variable, variable and here D local variable as another root. And from A, which is just a local variable, we can point to A object and then we can point to B and D and so on and so on. So this is the whole object graph. <coughs> And this is a super uh, important thing for the whole tracing GC's concept um, that we will cover soon. 
uh, okay so we have those pieces here uh, that we need to to use for the mark face algorithm and uh, what the mark algorithm in the end is doing is this mark uh, is this the object graph traversal so we know okay uh, this is the logical view so uh, we have the logical view of objects and the references between them there is a physical view let's stay for this logical view for a moment so we have our roots and here we is this for example this uh, a variable and the local variable and the whole object graph and uh, it is pretty easy and straightforward for you probably even now to imagine what we need to do. We need to traverse the whole graph to find out the every object that we can reach by traversing the possible references uh, between the objects, starting from the roots. We can do it in a various ways. Uh, for example, uh, we can use a recursion, uh, so we can write some recursive function that will start to traverse uh, objects uh, between each other um, uh, because of the references so let's say I would write I could write a method that will be called visit that takes a node and sorry for a pseudocode but it will be much faster without uh, worrying about types so visiting a node would be something like do something with the node and then uh, for each Mm, next node uh, in node get outgoing references uh, do some uh, visit now we, I could write such a super pseudo code way of mm, visiting the whole graph by a uh, uh, recursive function or function so we have a recursion here and um, we will traverse deeper and deeper into the graph just by calling recur recursive uh, calls to the same method that will visit the every possible object and that will be one of the possible implementation uh, nevertheless we need somehow to store the list of objects that we would like to visit and in this case, uh, in case of recursion, it is because the cold stack is storing, storing this list, like the recursion takes care of it, that we remember that, okay, we have next object to visit, we go deeper, but then we will return and call another method. So the cold stack is somehow responsible for storing the whole uh, information, what we else need to visit and when we need to continue. Or we can just create a regular list and store this to visit list as a list or a stack or anything else you can imagine. <clears throat> so uh, this would be another approach, having just list for doing that. So this object graph traversal would be uh, that let's start from the roots. Uh, so we would uh, start from them and uh, just by investigating them we will see that okay there is an object A and D to visit because they are pointing to those two objects. So we scanned those two, two roots and we added to the to visit list object A and D and that's fine. We also let's say marked somehow the information that we have already scanned those roots and we need to not to return to them in any way. Then uh, we start to visit to visit list as long as it is not empty. So we take an object A from to visit list, we are visiting this object, we are marking somehow that this object has been visited, so I'm making this here in a different color, and this marking is important for two reasons. First of all, uh, it handles cycle references because by when we mark that we have visited that particular object, when we threw another set of less or more complex references, we would return to this object. We will see that, okay, but it has been already visited, so we don't need to follow this cycle reference. So by default and out of the box, by marking visited objects, we are handling cycle references. And moreover, this marking uh, may be an information that will be used by the GC, because if we have marked something, if we have visited something, it means that there is a path 
from at least one root to this particular object, which means this object may be used because there is a path to it from a reach from a from a root. So it can be reached from at least one root. And by root we mean for example local variable. But okay, so we have visited object A and we just uh, we are removing it from the to visit list because it is it has has been visited and then we added also references to the d and b we have just added the outgoing references from object a uh, and now we have uh, d and b also added to the to visit list then we go for example we take d because it is the next object on to visit list we are visiting d and uh, then we add the a uh, we add e as a next object to be added to to visit because it, this is the outgoing reference from d and then uh, we mark it as a uh, visited uh, and we remove it from to visit because we have visited it then we will go into the d again but we will see that it has been visited so we will just do nothing and then we will take b as a next one we will visit it and we will remove it from the uh, from the to visit list and then we will visit a i mean e sorry we will visit e adding g to the to visit and so on and so on so by having this to visit list and by marking this object we are uh, discovering what is reachable and reachable and this is super important word for the gc design we have discovered what is reachable from the roots and if something is reachable it does it cannot be reclaimed because maybe someone will use it on the other hand we see that we haven't visited cnf so there are no roots uh, that will point to it by any reference which means it is a garbage because we cannot reach it in any way so cnf are the garbage that can be uh, removed here in this particular example so this is the object graph traversal in in the end super easy uh, but i really wanted to make it clear so i hope it is clear if it is not just do not hesitate to ask i can always clarify things so in the end after all this object graph traversal we have discovered that a b d a a b d e g sorry alphabet spelling for non-native is not trivial sometimes uh, so we have discovered those objects are reachable, uh, reachable so they cannot be deleted on the other hand cnf can be so returning to the physical view now uh, if we mark somehow the information about this reachability inside an object we will know in memory that this is the place when we can do something with this garbage we can the fact of visitation so the fact of the, the, this mark can be somehow if we somehow store it inside an object looking just at the memory now we see what is a garbage or not that's nice so we have just discovered the reachability of the objects uh, uh, so the object is reachable if there is at least one path from at least one root that points to it by mar marking algorithm so that's why this the whole face is called mark face this is about marking objects that are reachable and uh, re so we can split objects in the end to the reachable one and to the garbage uh, which is not reachable by the way uh, reachability is only the approximation of something that will be used because if object is reachable it simply means that the code can access it but we don't know if future code will access it because it may depend on i don't know the external data the user actions so obviously the reachability is only the closest we can get to discover uh, what may be used we don't know if it will be used because we don't know the future but at l for sure we know that if something is not reachable we can get rid of it because there is no way that the code will access it in any way in the future so it is a garbage 
Okay, so this is a theoretical introduction. And like uh, no GC in .NET, it is like working like that for any tracing GC in the world. So nothing uh, GC .NET specific, but it is like common approach that probably in most weeks I will explain something theoretically and then move to the uh, .NET specific implementations. Okay, just take a Okay, so uh, first of all, the roots. Uh, I mentioned the local variable as one of the possible roots. Uh, there are many different possible roots uh, that can hold your object graph. So they are those starting points from which you can uh, discover reach an object. So from where the GC will start uh, this object graph traversal. The very first two are about local variables. So if you have a local variable in your method, it may be an address on the stack or maybe in a register. So the GC will start uh, object graph traversal from those two sources. Then we have statics, like one of the other typical routes, static data or thread local static data. This is another kind of the route, maybe less common, at least we are not using it commonly, but it is sometimes used in internally even if we are not aware of it. Then the finalization queue is one of the routes and also uh, and those are the let's say the four five the four five most common ones and most obvious ones uh, routes from which the GC starts the, it's the graph traversal. Then also there is something which is called intergenerational references which is somehow uh, how the GC tracks references between generations and we will return to that in the week which will be about generations. I don't want to make here any spoilers even. It is related to the mm, feature which is called cards or card tables but it is not time now for explaining it so let's just move on. And this is one of the one of the routes from which GC will start its uh, algorithm, but it doesn't matter for our uh, purposes here in explaining the Mark algorithm. Okay, so we have this set of routes and then how it looks like in case of .NET, moving to things a little bit more, uh, let's say .NET specific. So the implementations looks like that. For every re root type, so for, for example, for stack or for finalization queue or for statics, which are just mm, uh, which are just uh, treated as a special type of handle. But this will be covered in the root is internal week uh, from every for every root type, like, for example, for the stack, like I said, or finalization, we start this mm, uh, object graph traversal uh, by discovering those roots and adding the, the, them to the visit list. But this two visit list in case of .NET is called, and in case, in case of .NET GC implementation is called the mark stack. The mark stack, mostly because it is used as a stack. Uh, so first in, first out, uh, data structure. Uh, so I will not refer to two visit list, but I will say will be saying from now about the mark stack. So the mark stack is the data structure kind of container where we mm, when we store all the objects that we would like to visit, we discovered that we need to visit them. And uh, for example, during the stack scanning, we will populate it uh, with uh, the roots discovered on the stack uh, incrementally or not it doesn't matter but how somehow the mark stack is uh, has at least one reference to visit and for each and that's that's the that's the true then the second uh, thing is that obviously for every object for the mark stack we are doing those uh, following steps and so we take an address from the mark stack because we can see uh, the mark stack as just a collection of addresses that we would like to visit. So we take a single address from it and we do the very first thing, which is setting the pinning flag. It may be a little bit surprising that the pinning is uh, 
suddenly uh, mentioned here because it sounds nothing related to the mark but marking is a perfect and all the whole object graph traversal is the perfect place when we can uh, consider the pinning concept so uh, just to um, explain in a few maybe words and to recall you the pinning allows you to make an object not movable uh, so the imagine that you have i don't know um, class that contains two fields and uh, mm -hmm, and that you would like to and i will just set up my mic a little bit different so you would like to have a method that is pinning this instance of this class and you can make it in c sharp by using unsafe uh, fixed statement so you can um, make a method that for example we will take your point and with the help of this fixed statement you can say okay i have i want to have a address of a field x of it uh, which will be set in that manner and this simply means uh, from now the object um, the instance pt is being pinned for the time of this method so uh, we are saying here about pinning by the stack uh, uh, by this local stack the variable or on in the register it doesn't matter by the local variable and although we are taking an address of a particular field in general we are pinning the whole point object instance here and uh, so this is the pinning and this means simply that if something like that happens uh, the runtime will provide this information to the gc uh, during the mark phase and will while scanning this particular method it will say okay i have here a local variable which is uh, pointing to an address and this is pinned address so it is just saying uh, that okay this is a root but it is a pinned root and because of that uh, now the pinning flag will be provided to the mark traversal uh, to the object graph traversal algorithm and uh, so I, that's why i'm saying that the runtime says so because the runtimes the runtime is providing this information okay now you are starting to traverse an object graph from a root which is pinned if, if it is pinned it sets the information about in the header of the object i will cover that in a moment uh, so this will set the pink flag <clears throat> then if we have done that we start the traversal and if uh, so we start the whole thing that i've just described you so we will uh, for example skip already visited object but because if we see that this object has been already visited it doesn't make sense to follow it again because it will introduce the cycle reference problem so we are skipping already visited object then we are marking this object and this is the important thing used later on by the gc and this marking is happening in the method table of the um, method table add pointer in the object uh, itself i will cover that in a moment also and then we are adding the outgoing references to the mark stack so the mark stack will be growing while we are traversing so this is i hope pretty straightforward like uh we the the one surprising thing might be here that we are setting this pinning flag uh, and uh, and that's all like the other is uh, pretty straightforward so uh, um, but that's not the the whole the whole story <laughs> we can uh, we and we need to add two points here this is the the let's say the the simple version of the of the true but there are two more points happening during this uh, traversal first of all there is an additional optional uh, step um, which is which can be described as translate the address that you have uh, that from which you would like to start the traversal to a proper managed object 
which might be pretty surprising because we, from what I said so far, we could expect that the mark stack contains only uh, addresses of objects because we, we were interested in references between objects. But it is not always the true and we will return to that in a few slides. So this is an optional step that typically is not happening because we have already an object, uh, the address to an object, but sometimes we need to translate this address to an object address. And uh, the second thing is uh, that we need to, to maintain a second uh, important data structure, which is called the mark list. And this is something that I have added, the, the, the step after marking the object. Uh, so by setting this bit in the method table, add uh, this address to so-called mark list. <clears throat> and mark list is a additional data structure that is a kind of optimization. It is not required by the mark algorithm by itself, but it is used to uh, make more efficient object scanning in the next phases of the GC. Uh, so I will cover it in a uh, only to I will mention it only here from the perspective of the mark algorithm and how it is used. I will cover that next week when I will be describing the, f the plan phase not sorry, in the two weeks, because next week is about the concurrent marking. So I will cover and I will explain the mark list usage in the plan phase in two weeks from now. Okay, so, so uh, but for now we can uh, just remember that the additional step is that we add the address of the visited object to the mark list. If it is not overflowed, because it is just, it has some limit of uh, size, so if it is big enough, it has grown uh, 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 too big, the, it will be just uh, ignored. We don't know, we don't want to grow it indefinitely. So there is a maximum uh, at which we will be not keeping uh, any more data in the mark list. So this is in the end the whole mark algorithm in .NET GC that then takes <laughs> hundreds of lines in the GC CPP file. Uh, let's just draw it, uh, maybe to explain it uh, once again, but in more visual way. So let me just switch to the drawing machinery. It is working, okay. Uh, so we have exactly the same situation. We have the, exactly the same object graph. We have here also mm, just one more thing, okay. So we have here exactly the same object graph uh, and I just prepared an empty space for the mark stack and mark list. Moreover, uh, I would like to m return to this uh, marking and pinning. First of all, I've said that, uh, first of all, I've said that, maybe, uh, Let's imagine that we are starting our scanning from the root number, from the root which is called A. So it will be a local variable which is called A. Obviously inside the dotnet it is not called A, it is just an address, for example, of the stack or the specific CPU register, but for our purposes let's make it just A. And we are starting our traversal. Uh, so by scanning it, uh, there is a whole runtime support for scanning uh, stack roots. We will discover A as a local variable and we will add A to the mark stack. So we will saying, okay, I would like to visit A. And for the purposes of this experiment, let's assume also that we already also scanned D. So we know that D should be visited. So we have populated a mark stack with A and D. Uh, and mark stack internally is just an array in case of .NET runtime, which is keeping information about that stack, uh, top of the stack but this is the detail that we return to. So, okay, we have scanned this 
our two routes, we don't have more, so let's stop with that. And then we start our traversal exactly in the same way that I've described uh, in this theoretical uh, introduction. So we will visit, uh, we will uh, start traversal. But there is this additional um, side note of pinning. So let's assume that A is pinned. So let's assume that somewhere in our code or maybe not A, maybe it will be D, which is pinned, um, to make it a little bit uh, verbose uh, and for some examples. So D is fixed. So let's start our traversal, uh, but we need also to remember uh, that D is fixed somehow, so it will need to consider that. We start our traversal from A, so we take A from the stack, although it may be D, it really depends because it is stuck internally. Uh, currently it would take a D because it is on top of the stack, but for my purposes, let's just forgive me and I will start from A. So I'm taking A uh, from the stack and I'm starting visiting it. Uh, I'm checking uh, Com let's the, the very first step was to set the pinning flag if the runtime says that I should pin it but a as a local variable is not a pinned so I will not have this information from the runtime so I'm not setting the pinning flag for a object mm, so I'm skipping this point uh, it is also a valid object address so I'm also skipping this optional part of uh, translating it to a, an, a managed object address. The next step was to mark an object. To mark an object I'm using the method table and here just a side note to explain how the object layout looks in memory in case of .NET. So if we have an object uh, it contains of three parts. Uh, first of all, there is a header and it is eight bytes in case of 64 uh, bit machineries, 64 uh, bit runtime. So it is eight bytes, uh, which is a header. And typically they may be some only zeros because it is for various purposes, but by default it is empty. So they will be eight byte uh, filled by zeros. Then we have method table pointer, which is another 8 bytes because it is pointer. So on the 64-bit machine, 64-bit runtime, sorry, it will be 8 byte long. And this is a super important pointer, which points to the whole metadata of the type. So there is another data structure, which is just describing this type. This is just a kind of handler that is the entry points saying what in the end the type is of this object. There is obviously the whole graph of additional more or less complex metadata uh, describing this uh, metadata, but it is not important. For our purposes, it's only important to know that it is a pointer which points to some data. And by the way, it is also pretty nice identifier because it is a pointer pointing to a metadata, so every type has different address, so we can tra treat metadata a pointer as a kind of unique identifier of every type. So we have this 8 bytes of metadata pointer, and then we have data. So if the type contains some data, it will be followed by it. Uh, if it has not, there will be at least 8 byte empty data, but we will return to that, it is not important here. Uh, for now, we need to remember header and meta table uh, pointer are always there. So what this marking is, how the marking is done in .NET GC, it is just setting the bit inside the method, method table pointer. Uh, which seems pretty strange because I said it is an address. So uh, we are just setting some single bit inside this address, uh, which sounds pretty dangerous, like we are modifying the address to something because it is an address pointing to some a valid address of metadata and then we are just setting some bits inside this address. But uh, it is 64-bit machine, sorry, 64-bit runtime, so uh, the metadata also are aligned to the um, 
are so-called word aligned. So every address, in fact, that we have, including metadata, is word aligned, which means it is a, every address is a multiplication of eight, um, and there, uh, which means uh, we can have only addresses like 0, 8, 16, 24, and so on and so on. Only the multiplication of eights are valid addresses from this perspective, which means two less significant uh, Mm, the two, 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 sorry, the two lowest bits of a method, tab method table address are always zeros because it is like if addresses are multiplication of eights, it means that the real address is there, but is here, but the uh, f two mm, lowest bits are always zeros like it is a binary code so probably you you know that so that every multiplication of 8 will have those two bits as zero so we have those two bits for our purposes and that's because of that it is safe to use one of these bits as a mark flag so it will be this one or this one it doesn't matter as far as i remember it is the first one so mark flag will be here and uh, was the lowest bit in the method table address this is safe like it we are not uh, mm, destroying the correct address if we would know would like to know the correct address the only thing we need to do is to uh, add it with uh, we need to zero the we need to zero the two mm, lowest bits and we will always get the correct method table address so the marking f is just by setting this method table bit inside the bit is a single bit inside the method table that then it will be interpreted by the gc by for its own purposes okay that's the story of uh, marking so we have added it uh, so we have set this part i i've made a lit a lot of drawings here so let's maybe switch to a different color uh, the different color can be set here okay so we have set uh, this particular bit inside this object because we have discovered a is reachable and then we will add b and d to our mar d or and b to our mark stack and so on and so on uh, and we will be just setting this mark bit inside objects that are reachable so for example here we have object b and we will set by because of this graph traversal we will set this bit this bit and so on and so on in object c it will be not set because we will not visit it so we will not mark uh, c as a reachable object so this particular bit will be not set and we will have only those one that have we have visited which is super uh, easy way of doing things like we have only single bit for marking an object and uh, that's pretty uh, it like by traversing all those objects we will visit all them that can be visited we will set those pointers uh, like we will set these bits in the method table and just to return to this fixed part uh, imagine that we have traversed everything that can be traversed and then from uh, we start from the root num from the root which is called d and now uh, we start again traversing we have added object d we will now start to the traversal from the local variable from the root which is pinned so this pinned flag will be reported and because of that the runtime will set the pinned flag inside the object because we just are starting visited and that's why we need to check it before checking if we have visited an object because it may happen that this object has been visited and uh, like d has been visited and then we just uh, starting to traverse from this particular local variable which is now fixed and now uh, we will just uh, be seeing that okay we started to traverse object d from the pinned uh, reference and then we will set this pinned flag and only then we check okay but this object has been visited so we don't need to do anything more 
and when this uh, pinning uh, flag is uh, made is this just a single by bit inside a header so now we are using uh, another part uh, <coughs> Uh, so in the header we have another place for a, another bit which will be for pinning and we will set it for object D so somewhere here we will have object uh, D also and uh, we will set the pinning flag for it and we will set uh, sorry the mark flag for it and we will set also a pinning flag for it so in the end the information about the pinning and uh, marking are just two single bits in every object that is lying in, in lying in our memory and then it will be interpreted by the gc uh, in the plan phase for example additionally uh, because of this uh, pinning flag it will know that in planning what to do with this object it cannot be moved because it has this flag set to one so two bits controlling these two super important behaviors and um, that's i believe uh, everything if it is not clear please do not hesitate to ask as always and one more thing is this mark list so every time we are visiting something we are adding objects so we will for example add object a d b uh, g a or e in a various orders and then we will use this information in a plan phase as i said but it will just need to in, in, just explain what the plan phase is for and so on so i it is not the not the place now to uh, explain why and how it is consumed by the plan phase uh, but it is very useful in the plan phase also the mark list just a set a limited set of objects that we have uh, visited so far limited by size okay so uh, what is what we can make as a kind of findings from this whole story so first of all uh, the mark and pinned flags are added only during the gc so as we as as well as as well as i was showing sorry uh, from before the gc happens in between the gcs uh, simply there is a memory inside the managed heap the objects are there but we don't know which are uh, marked we don't know which are pinned because this information is only discovered during the mark phase moreover it is cleared afterwards in the plan phase in the next phase so at the time of mark phase we are discovering what is marked we are discovering what is pinned we are using this information somehow in the plan phase the next one but then we are creating this information to have the clear normal form of objects after the gc <clears throat> This is pretty nice information like implementation detail but from that we know for example that looking at a regular memory dump in between GCs we won't see those bit sets because as I said they are only set during the GC. Uh, which means also that for example if you are writing a diagnostic tool and would like to know which uh, object is reachable and which is pinned you simply need to traverse the graph on your own to do the job that the GC would do because there is no this pinned uh, flag um, inside uh, the object itself All, only if you are happening to make a memory dump during the mark phase or ideally after the mark phase but between plan phase uh, so in at this moment when those bits are set then obviously you can see those bits but it is not very typical to have a memory dump at this particular point in time so uh, what what's else also uh, mark stack is used uh, i covered that you could use the recursion uh, so you could use uh, um, simply recursion for uh, maintaining to visit list but it would be kind of dangerous because we don't know the depth of this graph uh, so the, we could run out of stack space because recur recursion is using the stack for holding the data uh, for maintaining the recursive calls uh, so it would be dangerous to rely on on the stack size uh, for doing that uh, so instead of that we have the mark stack simply as a data structure keeping the information what we would like to visit next
then mark list will help us a lot in the next phase with one side note we need to sort it to be usable and helpful in the plan phase uh, so not only that we have uh, we are keeping this mark list as this uh, additional data structure for visited objects in the end we need to sort this list by the addresses inside because we will populate this only then this data structure only then this list will be useful in the plan phase so sorting of it is starts to be pretty important uh, in terms of efficiency of the whole gc because uh, it will just it is happening while the gc is done uh, so it is happening while the application is paused so the more efficient sorting of this mark list is the, the shorter pauses will be and that's why the sorting uh, should be efficient here and in the end, as we see, uh, the whole mark phase is pretty a lot of work to do. So uh, this is a lot of uh, non-sequential memory access because we are skipping all around the memory. We need to touch a lot of objects and we need to really not only read this memory to read, the, for example, the outgoing references, but we need also to uh, mark those uh, objects so we are invalidating a lot of uh, places in the memory which is also always a not so good thing because it can introduce a lot of uh, cache trashes and another stuff and it simply needs to have a memory access which is not sequential which is not optimized so a lot of memory accesses during the mark phase that's one of the reasons why it is worth to make a GC generational. So we split the whole managed heap inside into the some regions and we don't consider the whole object graph at once, but we can split it into a several subspaces called generations. Uh, so we will not have to travel the traverse the whole object graph. One of the reasons why the generations are beneficial. But still, it will be a lot of work, like visiting millions of objects, for example. Setting all those bits. <clears throat> okay, mm, then, uh, so this is the mark phase. I hope you know at least a little bit uh, how it works now. And going further, this mark list sorting story. So uh, it is pretty interesting because of two reasons. First of all, uh, this uh, sorting has been optimized in .NET 5 very recently. So while reading announcements about .NET um, improvements, one, for example, in this famous um, um, article .NET 5 performance improvements by Stephen Taupe, there is also a mention of this faster sorting of the list used by the GC. And it has been improved indeed. And uh, why did that happen is another uh, reason why it is interesting because it happens on the .NETOS conference that I'm, as I said, we are .NETOS, so we organize things for uh, for you. And there was a conference in 2019, which was about, as we always like, about advanced stuff in .NET. And there were two uh, speakers then there there was a Dan Schechter that has a talk about .NET intrinsic in call CLR talking about parallelization of work help mm, possible due to hardware uh, high performance instructions available inside CPUs uh, and he was describing his journey through improving uh, array sort making it few times faster and I really invite you to watch it because it is a really awesome uh, presentation, how you can write a much faster code uh, with the help of .NET in 3 ne 6 a very hard word. And there was also a Peter Solich, uh, Solich uh, from .NET team, .NET runtime team, which was describing .NET garbage collector in general. But uh, it was watching also and it was very nice that speakers were watching their own uh, the, the mm, presentations and 
Peters uh, was watching this presentation and she said, he said, Dan, but <laughs> we could use your algorithm and your findings to make Markley sorting uh, faster. Uh, because we are using sorting in the GC and it would be really nice to make it faster and your work making it faster a few times would be really beneficial. And it was the very first idea that has been coined during the conference talk uh, on the um, during the breaks, let's say, uh, which has been coined into a PR that come uh, half a year later into the .NET runtime. And finally, it has been added to the .NET 5, uh, as I said. So we have this pull request, uh, which is um, just one of the biggest pull requests outside of the .NET runtime team, making a pretty important change into the GC uh, source code from Dan. Uh, the code that is just making faster sorting of this mark list with the help of the CPU uh, instructions uh, for making uh, parallel work. So with the help of it, uh, the faster sorting is now inside .NET runtime uh, from the .NET 5, which also allows to make bigger lists. Uh, and the bigger list uh, is always beneficial. The mark list, the bigger mark list, the more data we can use. Uh, so it will be more helpful in the flan phase if they are bigger, still being faster. So we have shorter GC pauses thanks to that code, which is also uh, while maintaining bigger list. Super, super nice story that is about how we can cooperate with each other to make things better in general, uh, thanks to the community uh, support and so on and so on. So this is a pretty nice story. I mm, invite you to follow this PR because it clearly shows um, how the improvement looks like, how it pl plugged into the previous code and so on. So it is pretty, pretty nice. So uh, this is the mark list sorting story. Two side notes also. I mentioned that uh, there is this optional step, which means translate it to the proper address of a managed object. And this is because uh, sometimes we have something which is called interior pointers. Typically references just are pointing to the beginning of another, another object. So a typical reference, a regular reference is just pointing to the uh, method table pointer of another, another object. But uh, we can have pointers which are not s behaving like that. And if you were using refs in C sharp, this is exactly the case. So typically when you have a reference, uh, I, as I said, this reference means that, for example, if object A has a reference to D, this reference is pointing to the method table pointer. So at the, let's say, beginning of an object. So every regular reference is pointing to a beginning of an object. But we can have references which will be called interior pointers that are pointing inside uh, an object, not at the beginning, but inside. And if you take a ref to a field of an object like here, uh, so we have G, which has a field Z, and this is, uh, uh, we are taking it as a reference. It is simply now an interior pointer. So this E as a, uh, local reference and a local root is an address which will point here, which means it is not pointing at the beginning of the object. So we need to translate it to a proper address of a managed object. This can be an array. So if it is an, an array and it will be just one of the elements of an array, it needs to be translated to the beginning of the array. Uh, or it may be just be a field of a particular object. So this why it is optional because typically those references are just uh, pointing to the beginning of an object but sometimes we are just seeing those interior pointers and then we need to make this translation we will see the code of this translation uh, at the beginning of the code are responsible for starting the whole graph traversal the method is called gc heap promote i will return to that in a second and then we see this code that is saying okay but if the runtime says that this particular root 
uh, this particular um, yeah, let's say root is an interior pointer and it is saying that with the help of this flag and the runtime obviously knows from the JIT or from the other stuff that this is an interior pointer then uh, this translation happens in the find object uh, it is just saying okay i'm having an address but it is not an beginning of an object so i'm converting it and finding an object that contains this address and translating it to this particular address and this is super interesting uh, how it is done and um, I will not describe it today because it requires uh, to understand something else which is called a brick and the whole brick table concept and this will be covered in the plan phase so in the two weeks uh, although at this stage in the mark phase the bricks are not fully available we can say they are not available at all still it will be beneficial to return to that when I will introduce the brick concept. So for now just remember that there is this optional step. It needs to translate the address from an object to an object from inside an object to the object itself. At this moment the brick feature, the brick mechanism is not fully available so it simply scans the memory to try to find the object that is inside the, mm, the, the object that contains the given address and this scanning is an overhead so uh, probably we would like not to have too many interior pointers to interpret because it requires uh, just a regular linear scanning of memory at this stage. Later on they can be optimized but at this stage it requires just a pure set scanning of memory. And the second side note uh, uh, regarding the graph uh, or the object graph very simple one when we because I said about the object graph in general as a concept and um, various tools are saying uh, about it in a various ways showing various measurements and showing you the graph uh, object graph in various ways so um, three important concepts regarding the object graph itself theoretically one theoretically one let's say uh, if you have an object graph like here presented uh, we can um, <coughs> introduce three ne three important from the diagnostic perspective three important things obviously one of the most interesting uh, and typically shown by tools thing is the shortest root path so for example if you would like to investigate why uh, this object is reachable uh, because for example it is big and it introduced memory leak most of the tools will show you their shortest root path and it will be in this case the path roof root and a and h and this is all like this is the shortest root path through this uh, particular uh, references and this is pretty interesting obviously it is the shortest root path so logically it may be important because it is the shortest but always look at the other paths that keeps this object reachable because maybe this is only kind of cache and the true logic and the business logic keeping this object alive is through this reference or maybe through this reference so there may be a various paths to, a, to, an, uh, to an object and to have a full picture you should be always interested in understanding all of those not only the shortest one while unfortunately a lot of tools is showing you typically only the shortest one or just forcing you to show to see the shortest one and you need to click something to, sh to see the uh, other ones other thing is the mm, two concept uh, the dependency subgraph and the retained subgraph and this is again uh, about uh, understanding what is being alive and why and what is this um, let's say how is the 
big impact of it uh, in terms of memory usage. So imagine you have object B and you are interested in the subgraph which is created by this object. And dependency subgraph, uh, which is another pretty commonly shown uh, measurement in various tools. It is just a sum of every object that you can reach from it. So in this case, it will be a sum of sizes from object D, A, F, G, and H. So from L, every, every of this object will be counted in this total size because you can reach every of this object from the B, which is okay, which is pretty easy to measure because and calculate so various tools are preferring it because it is just uh, you can traverse the whole subgraph and add sizes but unfortunately not so many tools is showing you the retained subgraph the one that is just the subgraph that will go on all together with the object itself so if at some point in time b will be no longer needed the retained subgraph will be the part of the dependency subgraph that will be no longer needed also just because the B has gone. So we will not need D, A and F no more because they are the uh, objects kept alive by the B itself. And that's why this retained subgraph sometimes is pretty interesting because it is the real um, part of the memory taken by this particular object in itself and the whole object kept alive by it. So retained would be nice to be seen in various tools. Unfortunately, most of those tools are not showing you the retained size or retained subgraph because it is much um, more complex to calculate because it is not only the subgraph, but then you need to traverse the whole size, the whole graph and um, make just kind of calculation and exclude the ones that can be reached from different objects. So it is pretty complex to calculate. Okay, but that was a kind of side note for the diagnostics. I couldn't resist to mention that. <sighs> Let's just drink me a few. We should be slowly ending. So the last part is the inside the code part, because I hope for now you, you know something, at least a little how this marking is happening. We have those bits set, we have the object graph traversal, we have pinning, uh, we have roots and we have mark stack and mark list as the most, the two most important data structures here. And if you would like to investigate the mark face code, there is a GC heap mark face method and it is pretty straightforward name. Like it is indeed the method which is responsible for the mark face, mark face um for the whole marking traverse uh, for the whole marking for the whole object graph traversal then we will see and it is pretty well structured i can say uh, we, it is structured with the, the calls of the following methods uh, with also pretty straightforward so for example inside the mark phase we have a call to a gc uh, scan scan roots method which is responsible for scanning the roots it is using the stack walk frames helper and uh, that will go through all the stack frames uh, from the all the thread uh, in your app and will call GC heap promote on every object that has been discovered as a root uh, on, on the stack on. Uh, so it is exactly the uh, local variables part of the roots. Then for example, we have finalized GC scan roots. Then we have GC scan scan handles, which is for uh, scanning all the handles. And uh, again, every time here the same callback is called. So we have various sources, but in the end, the underlying machinery is calling GC heap promote for every object that has been discovered as a root. And then GC heap promote callback is just, just the one starting the whole object graph traversal from this particular root. Uh, handles is an important 
very important topic because uh, for example uh, statics are kept alive by handles they can be also pinned handles so um, the various uh, handles we can uh, meet here and uh, some of them will be reported as pinned some of them will be just reported as a regular ones but again this is just through scanning through all the handles then we will have a scanning through the cards uh, machinery that I mentioned, so the intergenerational references, and uh, I will cover that later on by when describing the generations. Uh, so it is another set of uh, <coughs> references, uh, routes that we can map, and then pretty a lot of code. I would let's say I would say half of the mark phase method is related to the dependent handles. You have uh, something like weak references in .NET dependent handles and uh, that needs to be interpreted because at this stage we know what is reachable so we know what will be garbage collected for example we know um, uh, what are the dependencies between the objects so now it is a good time for some bookkeeping regarding the dependent handles thing but maybe this is not so super important uh, from the perspective of the whole algorithm and then uh, we have the gc heap promote method so if you are interested in digging in into the source code uh, beside uh, the mark phase method which is the high level method you can s look at the gc heap promote method that is calling a lot of macros and those macros uh, are called go through object cl for example which triggers this traversal in the end calling a uh, mark object simple method and uh, this mark object simple will use mark stack array the one which is just implementing the mark list uh, sorry mark stack uh, this is an array keeping information about the bottom and the top of the stack so you will see it as a just a regular array of addresses for example and this is maintained and this is the heart of the mark algorithm like the mark object simple uh, method and then for example gc mark uh, uh, gc mark which is the pretty short method setting this mark bit inside the method table uh, let's just make a short search inside the source code to show you the, the gc mark Mm, where I have the Visual Studio GC Mark, GC Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so as you see, GC Mark is pretty simple. Um, it is just setting the bit inside the method table, and that's all. So this is one of the simplest methods inside the GC source code, and uh, just the responsible for marking. You will see pretty mystic naming sometimes. So for example, there will be GC mark one and GC mark. Typically, it means one is a uh, kind of wrapper around the second one, and one is called uh, or sometimes another, depending on various uh, scenarios. Um, you need to get used to this naming simply and here we will see for example that uh, okay this GC mark is just doing exactly what we could expect and we see that GC marked and uh, this mark is just setting uh, the thing that I described so it is setting the marked bit inside the method table the mark is the one Okay, so it is the second bit, not the first one, as I drawed. Uh, so the GC mark is the, the, the second lowest bit inside the method table address. This is how it is working. So this is a pretty, uh, very low level stuff at the low, uh, 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 like the bit level of the, of the object itself, but uh, pretty straightforward. Nothing super surprising is happening here uh, at this level and uh, okay so we have it here and additionally um, i said that the mark list is maintained so we have this mark list as a second data structure inside dccpp and um, this one is 
maintained by the M boundary macro, uh, which is also called inside this mark traversal object. So every time you mark an object, you are also calling the M boundary method with a really, um, with a really, I don't know how it was named like that. Uh, I would really love to ask Maoni why the ma um, M boundary name has been chosen for this purpose. And M boundary is very simple mark uh, list maintenance. So as you see, M boundary of a given address is just um, putting this address inside a mark list and increasing the index. And this is just an uh, operation on addresses inside the mark list. So it is pretty simple. Uh, um, only adding collection that will add the object uh, addresses to the mark list itself. So you will see also the, the calls to this M boundary from time to time, uh, which will populate the mark list. And uh, that's almost all. <laughs> also, if you are interested in the sorting part, uh, mark list, first of all, is maintained and sorted only for non-concurrent ephemeral GCs. So um, that's the reason why it is beneficial and I will cover that later on. But in this particular case, you have a GC that is for generation zero or one and it is non-concurrent, then we use mark list. And then you can find the sorting on the, of it. For example, GC heap sort mark list or in plan phase, depending on our various conditions, there is this do VUX VAWIX sort method that is using parallel sorting, the one added by Dan Schechter uh, to the RoadNet runtime. Really, really nice thing. And we can even see this that, okay, if this has been compiled with the support of it, and if the instruction, the given instruction set is supported, we are making uh, our mark list bigger, five times bigger, for example. So we will be able to keep five more five times more addresses of objects visited in the mark list if this instruction set is supported. Uh, because it is so fast that we can even make it bigger and it will be still faster. Uh, so it is nice. Uh, so obviously this, those slides will be provided so you can follow all those uh, deep internal stuff also if you would like to look around in the GC CPP file. Uh, let just me show you this particular macro which is pretty uh, pretty important and we'll try it and and th this is mm -hmm. yes and this macro looks like that so <laughs> we will see uh, CP GC CPP file is pretty macro based, so there are some important parts of it which are defined as macros, which looks like that, and this is the one which is responsible for uh, going through this particular object, and then we will see uh, calls to it uh, from macro to macro, another macro, and go through object here is just re reading the metadata of the particular objects this, to get the information where we have an ongoing references from this object under the given address. So uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty uh, all of it. I hope it covered some uh, things that you would do love to know about mark face. So uh, probably it is good time to slowly uh, close uh, the topic. Uh, I see the very first question, so I'll answer, I will answer soon. If you have any more questions, do not hesitate to ask. It is now good time for asking. Uh, if nothing, if something was not clear, please ask because I would really love to see it as a clear uh, explanation of the internals. So if something was not clear, it will be kind of failure from my side. So please do not hesitate to ask. Okay, so uh, we have a question and uh, the question is uh, that I said that the mm, GC scan handles uh, is keeping statics alive. And um, yeah, and you Ultern, you thought that statics are not part of the objects and are allocated on stack. 
So where do statics live? So, uh, so in general, the question is why GC hand why handles of type uh, of this particular and uh, let's say why handles are keeping statics alive maybe just to rephrase the question and this is valid question it is kind of question that will be answered in the part that i will cover regarding gc regarding roots internals but as a kind of spoiler i can draw it in a very first a very few um, um, seconds like uh, if you have a static the static is just a regular object so if you have a managed heap and it is just a managed heap of your application and you are having a static inside a type and it is a reference type you are having this as a regular object so it has a header a method table data this is a static instance let's call it s uh, what is uh, but it is static, so it needs to be interpreted somehow. So the difference is that um, the information about it is kept by a handle, uh, which is just an, an array, sorry, which is just another array uh, kept somewhere. And this is a array of object references, which is uh, keeping information about all the statics defined in your app domain. So it will be just kept by it from this particular array. And moreover, uh, this array is kept alive because it is kept by a regular strong handle uh, kept uh, alive, uh, this particular static array handle. So um, I hope it was clear enough. Uh, you have a uh, handle that is called strong handle. And then you have an array of references to objects which is let's call it statics array and then you have a reference to this particular instance of a static just as a regular object on the managed heap so why it will be kept alive obviously because when scanning uh, handles we will start from it we will go through this to this array, we will scan every uh, outgoing reference of it, making this, uh, making this uh, marked, and also making this marked and every other static that is referenced from this array. This is static, so it is special because JIT is aware of it. So if it is seeing that you are using a particular static from a particular type, it knows that, okay, uh, this particular element of this array means, uh, and keep it uh, like an offset, for example, is an address of a static. So JIT will translate usage of your particular static instance as uh, looking at the particular offset inside that and it will know that okay but it means in the end it, it has an address of a given um, object so uh, statics are nothing else like a regular object kept alive by an array which is kept alive by a strong handle uh, which has an additional support from JIT so because of that um, it knows how to use it and from the marking phase perspective nothing magical happens here it will be just a static array being alive because of the strong handle okay i don't know Altern, if it answers your question you can elaborate you can say uh, <coughs> whether you are satisfied or not so uh, we have covered the marking phase. Uh, if you have no more questions, probably we can slowly sh close this webinar today. Uh, we marked uh, we marked the topic of the mark phase, setting the bit inside the method table, setting the pinning flag. Uh, we covered the whole marking traversal, and uh, and that's all. If you don't have any more questions, uh, let's see next week. Next week will be about the concurrent mark. So uh, the today I describe you the mark phase, which is non-concurrent, which is just happening while the whole application is 
paused, which is pretty nice because it means nothing is happening while we are marking, we are, while we are traversing the mark, when we are traversing the object graph. Next week I will cover the concurrent mark phase, which is um, a little bit more complex because we are making a whole object graph traversal and the whole marking while the application is running, so the references between objects may um, change, so it makes this whole thing a little bit more complex. Uh, Uh, okay, and the second question, just as the <laughs> end, uh, by the end of the of the webinar. Uh, mm, yes, uh, I mean, why we need pinning? I will mention that while probably while discussing rot internals exactly, uh, because it will be pretty nice time for that. Probably not today. Okay. So, once again, thank you, see you next week with the concurrent mark phase, I hope you will enjoy that, if that, spread the knowledge about it on Twitter or anything else, and anywhere else, just to make, a, how it is said, a noise about it. So, thank you very much and see you next week, bye!